Sure appreciate it, Jacob. We had him over at our place uh, before our family camp in over Memorial Day, and he was real big help to us, and sure appreciate him. So, right there for you. Your Bible's got stuff in the wrong. Your Bible's got stuff in the wrong place. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Yeah. Keep your distance. <laughs> And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were bewildered, because they were each one hearing them in his own tongue." And when they were amazed and marveled, saying, Why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that each we each hear them in our own language to which we are born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongues, speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others were mocking and saying, They are full of sweet wine. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, to you and give heed to my words. Okay. Man, I'm glad it's been not, it hasn't been a very... Uh, Exciting year, man, nothing's really been happening since last time. <laughs> you know, it, uh, I think that's probably something that the Jews probably were thinking during this time. You know, it wasn't, uh, last year wasn't very exciting, but something, something happened. This, this Passover that they just had had and the Pentecost that they're uh, appearing for here in Acts chapter 2, um, something's different about it. Now, uh, so my, uh, you know, I was just, Minding my own business, uh, you know, a few couple months or so ago, when I got a text when I was riding, we were moving pairs, and so Mr. Wilson texted me and he said, I uh, asked if I would preach on setting the stage, what God did to set the stage for the first proclaiming of the gospel, uh, set the stage for the rest of the messages out of the book of Acts, including the Feast of Pentecost and the immersion with the Holy Spirit. No pressure, I can just do whatever I want, you know, it's... Uh, uh, since you're the first speaker, you know, it doesn't, uh, you can just preach all the way through Acts 2 or through 5 maybe. But uh, anyway, well, I'll stick pretty close to what, uh, what I was assigned. So if we're good students of, uh, let's just say, American culture, we, we know the, the history, we know some of the high points and probably even maybe some uh, really fine details. So for example, uh, when was the Declaration of Independence signed? So July, July 4th, 1776. Uh, you can go ahead and shout it out. Uh, when was, uh, how many original colonies were there? 13. Who said, I cannot tell a lie, I cut down the cherry tree? <laughs> Bill Clinton, you said? <laughs> Okay. No, uh, that was George Washington. I, 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 sometimes people think, oh, I must have been honest Abe. You know, he was being honest, couldn't tell a lie. No, it was George Washington when he, when he uh, cut down the cherry tree. So the Jews, they also, at least, at least the devout Jews, do their history. So yeah, let's turn back to Acts chapter 1. And so Jesus, after he resurrected and he had... Uh, I'll start in verse 1, and it says, uh, The first account I composed, Theopolis, about all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day when he was taken up, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he chosen. To these he also presented himself alive, after his suffering, by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over the period of forty days, and speaking to the, th the things concerning the kingdom of God, and gathering them together, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem, 
But, wait, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, You have heard from me, for John immersed with water, but you shall be immersed with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so when they had come together, they had asked him, saying, Lord, is it th at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or epochs by which the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. So Jesus made this, this uh, uh, instructed the apostles, they stick around, you're going to be uh, immersed with the, the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Okay, and so as we're going through, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the immersion with the Holy Spirit to start off with, and then we're going to go uh, back into some of the, the, what God did to set up the, the Jews to be ready to hear the gospel. And so, first off, uh, as we read in Acts chapter 2, uh, there was the day of Pentecost, uh, which the, the Greek word Pentecost is 50. It was the, the feast of the first fruits of the wheat. Let's turn back to Exodus chapter 23. Exodus 23. Exodus 23, and we'll start in verse 14. And it says, Three times a year you shall celebrate a feast to me. You shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For seven days you are to eat unleavened bread as I commanded you at the appointed time in the a month of Abib, for, you are, for in it you came out of Egypt. And none of you shall appear, appear before me empty-handed. Also you shall observe the feast of the harvest of the first fruits of your labors, and from what you sow in the field, also the feast of the ingathering at the end of the year when you gather the fruit of your labors from the field. Three times a year, you, you, all your males shall appear before the Lord God. Okay, so three times, three major feasts, the, the, the feast of the Passover or unleavened bread, the feast of what's known as Pentecost in the New Testament, but it's the feast of first fruits in the Old Testament, and the Feast of the End Gathering, all the males had to appear before the Lord. Okay? Let's turn uh, to Exodus 34. And one, one more bit of information before we go back to Acts 2. Exodus 34. And if you read before this, uh, in, like in verse 18 and so on, it talks about the Feast and Leavened Bread. But in verse 22 of Exodus 34, it says, and you shall celebrate the feast of weeks, that is, the first fruit of the wheat harvest, and also the feast of the end gathering at the turn of the year. So there's a few different names. The Feast of Pentecost is known as the Feast of Weeks, the, the Feast of the Harvest, uh, mentioned that one time in Exodus, uh, Exodus 23, the Feast of the Harvest of the First Fruits. Okay? And so that's, that's important to remember, it's the first fruits of the wheat harvest. Okay? Not just any harvest, of the wheat harvest. So with that information, let's go back to Acts chapter 2 real fast. And remember that for later. <clears throat> Acts chapter 2. So all of the males had to be before God, had to appear before God at the Feast of Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks. Um, or the First Fruits or however you want to, whatever name you want to give it. And so this is just showing most of the evangelical world will have the, the one place as the upper room, okay, which is incorrect because all of the, the males had to be in the temple, had to appear before God in the temple. So the one place that, the, that the, all the males had to be and that they were uh, in Acts chapter uh, 2, verse 1, they, on the day of Pentecost came and they were all together in one place. That was the temple, not the upper room. So in verse 2, Something happens, it says, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them as uh, tongues as a fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. So just, just in case uh, someone's tried to trick you, uh, when, when the immersion with the Holy Spirit happened, because it doesn't happen anymore, uh, it had to consist of three things. It had to have a noise like a violent rushing wind. Now, it doesn't say a violent rushing wind. It's just a noise like a violent rushing wind. 
And secondly, there had to be tongues as a fire distributing themselves on those who were immersed with the Holy Spirit. Okay? And third, the Holy Spirit filled them and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now we get more information on what that was if we continue reading in verse 5. It says, now, when they were, now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because they were each hearing them in their, speak their own language. And they were amazed and marveled, saying, why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that each one of us hears in our own language to which we are born? And it goes on and gives a list of those who are there. So this would be similar. And of course, I mean, I don't know exactly what it's like, but uh, what it, because obviously it doesn't happen today. But let's just say I'm speaking English, and you have someone that only can speak German. They're, I'm speaking English, but they're understanding me in German. Yeah, that's, that's what this was, was like. They were hearing them, but also it wasn't that they were just... Uh, well, they had a translator, they just spoke whatever language it was, they understood that they were Galileans. They understood that they were different, they didn't speak the same language. And that, that uh, eliminates a lot of people. Now, the second uh, false teaching that comes from this passage is that you have either the 120 that were immersed with the Holy Spirit, or you have the 3,000 that were immersed with the Holy Spirit. That's what the, most of the faith-only world will teach. But as we consider some of the evidence, and if we can continue to go down in verse 12, um, we'll see, and they were con all continued with amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking them, saying they are full of sweet wine. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let it be known to you and give heed to my words. He took his stand with the eleven, not the 120, not the 3,000. Okay, Peter took a stand with the 11. They were all Galileans. There was, there was people um, in that group of 120 that were not Galilean. There were people that were amongst the 3,000 that were not Galilean. And the, the, the record we have is that all of those who were speaking who were immersed with the Holy Spirit were Galilean. It was only the 12 apostles that were immersed with the Holy Spirit. It wasn't the 120, it wasn't the 3,000. And it was a sign for the Jews. I won't get into uh, to Cornelius too much today. That was also a sign for the Jews. Uh, and it was just his household that was immersed with the Holy Spirit. But a question that we need to ask ourselves is, why did they believe this? I mean, it's not like there wasn't people trying to trick them, you know, it's not like all of a sudden there's this amazing thing happening. It was kind of, you know, boring in Israel and uh, no one was, you know, there was no magic arts practice or anything like that. That's not the case, because there was. Why did the Jews believe this? And obviously not all of them did. But we're going to, uh, even though, the, it, I want to be very clear, the immersion with the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit are two separate ways the Holy Spirit empowered people, okay? The immersion of the Holy Spirit only happened twice. The day of Pentecost, Acts 2, and then in Acts chapter 10. Okay, the gifts of the Holy Spirit were, were different. That, was a, that only was able to happen by the laying on of the apostles' hands. You weren't, like, nobody just was able to spread that. Philip, that's why in Philip in Acts chapter 8, he couldn't pass that gift on. He wasn't an apostle of Jesus Christ, okay? Okay. Uh, that's why Peter and John had to come down and they laid their hands on them. And it's interesting, you got to pay attention to the language, that the Holy Spirit didn't indwell them. He came upon them or fell on them. Because they already had been immersed in the name of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit already indwelt them, but they didn't have the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He hadn't fallen on them yet. But let's turn to Hebrews real fast. And, and the same principles, I think, for the gifts of the Spirit will also apply... Uh, to the immersion with the Holy Spirit in reference to why the Jews believe this and not, for example, as we'll see, Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter 8. But in Hebrews chapter 2, the purpose of the gifts of the Spirit, we'll see, is to prove the Word of God. So in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 2, or I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2, the writer of Hebrews says, For if the word spoken through angels pr proved unalterable, 
and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard, God also bearing witness with them by both signs and wonders and various miracles and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. The gifts of the Holy Spirit, the, the signs, the wonders, the miracles were to prove the word of God. It wasn't that they were just believing, well, there's, this is these guys, they're healing people. Or they're, you know, and I'm not saying that's not something to be amazed about, but as we'll see in a second here, Simon had his way with some people, Simon the sorcerer, uh, and he was tricking people very easily with his magic arts. But the, the signs were to prove the word of God. Let's turn to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Now, there is no gifts recorded here necessarily in Acts 17, but it's relatively plain when you go throughout teaching this, like Acts chapter 8, for example, Philip was going about teaching the gospel and he was performing miracles to prove the word as we've discussed. So when the, when the other people are going preaching the gospel, that's something that they, they didn't have the New Testament like we have. So they, there was something they needed to do to be able to, to prove the gospel. Okay, this is, this is what the gospel says, and we'll see a little bit later that the, the signs and wonders were actually prophesied about in the Old Testament. But in Acts chapter 17, in verse 2, we'll start, and it says, And according to Paul's custom, he went to them for three Sabbaths, reasoned with them in, with, from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and raise from the dead, and saying to this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded to join Paul and Silas, along with a great multitude of God-fearing Greeks uh, and a number of leading women. And it goes on and talks about the Jews being jealous. But they went and they reasoned from the scriptures. Paul just didn't go in there and start you know, laying his hands on people and people were being healed or they were, uh, the Holy Spirit was falling upon them or whatever and they were shaking around and rolling on the floor or whatever. That's not what happened. Paul reasoned with them from the scriptures. We see a little bit later in Acts chapter 17, verse 10, it says, And the brethren, immediately, this is in Berea now, uh, sent Paul and, and Silas uh, by that night uh, to Berea. And when they arrived, they went to the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those of Thessalonica. They, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Many of them, therefore, believed along with a number of prominent Greeks and men, women and men. So we see that Paul here, Paul and Silas going into the synagogues, and the Bereans are examining the scriptures. Paul is, just like he was in, in the first part, Acts there, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and raise again. They, he would be doing the same thing. And, the, and the, the Bereans were going and they were looking at the scriptures. They were reasoning. They were saying, are these things so? Turn back to Acts chapter 8 real fast here. Acts chapter 8, and I've kind of mentioned a little bit about Simon, uh, the sorcerer here, and Philip being in Samaria. Uh, but in, we'll start in verse 4 of Acts chapter 8. <clears throat> And this is after, this is when Paul is still Saul at the time. In the first part, uh, Paul is going around persecuting the church, and Stephen's killed at the end of chapter 7. And in verse 4 of Acts chapter 8, it says, Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. And Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. And the multitudes were giving, with one accord, were giving attention to what he sa uh, was said by Philip. As they, heard the, as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of, of them, shouting with a loud voice. And many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. And, they, and, they, and there were much joy rejoicing in the city. Now there was a certain man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, uh, from the smallest to the greatest of them, are giving attention to him, saying, This man is what is called the great power of God. And they were giving uh, him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. But when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom 
And in the name of Jesus Christ, they were being immersed, men and women alike, and they would have, at this point, when they were immersed, received the indwelling Holy Spirit. And you see, read a little bit later that Peter and John had to come down and they laid their hands on them and the Holy Spirit fell on them and they got the gifts so they could go preach the gospel as well. But the point we're reading this here is that Simon, what's the difference between what Simon was doing and what Philip was doing? It wasn't that the, the people of Samaria didn't have anybody uh, doing some wonders or maybe something to, to get people's attention. It says for a long time they were giving him attention and uh, they, were, they were astonished with his magic arts. But when Philip preached the gospel of the kingdom, now the, the gospel had not yet extended to the Gentiles. Okay? Is that not uh, Acts chapter 10 that happened? The Samaritans weren't, you know, they weren't the favorite of the Jews, nor were they really the true practicing Jews. And Jesus, with the woman at the well, had that conversation that he said, you worship what you don't know, we worship what we know, and so on. I won't get into that. But they still had some knowledge. Okay, they had, they had the law of Moses. And as we're, we're going to see later on tonight, that it's not like we just, well, we'll cut out the law of Moses, that was just something that was in the past and really no good to us. We'll see that God actually had started laying a foundation for the message to be received in the law from the beginning. But as we see here, let's turn over to, to Matthew 11 and to answer the question, why did they believe Philip over Simon? Now this here is when Jesus, uh, in Matthew chapter 11 here, uh, John had been taken into custody. John the Immerser had at this point uh, in verse 1 of, of Matthew chapter 11. And it says, And it came about that when Jesus had finished giving instruction to his twelve disciples, he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now, when John in prison heard of the works of Christ, he sent word to his disciples and said to him, are you the expected one, or shall we look for someone else? And Jesus answered and said to him, Yes, Brother John. No, he didn't say that. He said, Go and report to John what you see and hear. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who keeps from stumbling over me. See, Jesus just didn't give, oh yeah, I'm, I'm the chosen one. He points to scripture that was prophesying about the things that he was doing. He points to scripture that was prophesying about the signs and wonders, the healings of the lame. Philip there is talked about uh, the lame being healed in Acts chapter 8. That's something that was prophesied about. That's something that they could look back to. They believed Philip because he was, he was uh, preaching to them the scripture, which is not the New Testament. I mean, there's, I'm not saying we throw the New Testament out, but they had the Old Testament scriptures. But also, it was the signs that there was prophesied about that those who were devout, Acts chapter 2 was devout men, okay? Those who would study, who would look into the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, they would be reading that and they would be saying, seeing this is what we've been waiting for. And obviously a lot of them didn't, but those who were really true seekers, they saw it. Turn back to Isaiah chapter 35. And this is where Jesus, uh, the scripture that Jesus quotes here. Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35, verse 3. <clears throat> and it says, Encourage the exhausted and strengthen the feeble. Say to those who are anxious, with anxious heart, Take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance and recompense. The recompense of God will come, but he will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped and the lame will leap like deer. And the tongue of the dumb will shout for joy, for the waters will break forth in the wilderness. And then also if you turn over to uh, Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61. 
This is another, another, the other part that Jesus uh, tells them to tell John the Immerser in prison when he's answering, are you the chosen one? Isaiah chapter 61, starting in verse 1, it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring the good news to the afflicted, and has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and freedom to prisoners, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, and to comfort all who mourn. Turn ahead to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. And we'll see this is also a principle that Jesus used when he preached the, uh, the gospel of the kingdom through this three and a half year ministry. And Luke chapter 4, in verse 14. And it says, When Jesus returned to Galilee, and the, spirit, the power of the Spirit and the news about him spread through all the surrounding area, district, and he began teaching in their synagogues, and he was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet of Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has pro uh, sent me to proclaim release of the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are downtrodden, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all who in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. See, Jesus didn't just go around performing signs, and that's not what, what his purpose was. It, if you look in Mark chapter 2, the, 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 the man who was lame from his, from his, I think it was a baby. And um, it was a Sabbath day, and Jesus says, take up your pallet, or, or your sins are forgiven. And people were kind of scoffing, you know, what, what's he doing here? And he says, hey, is it easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or take up your pallet and walk? But he says, so that you know that the Son of Man ha on earth has authority to forgive sins, he said, take up your pallet and walk. So, so that they knew that he had authority. They knew the scripture he said was true in other parts. That's what his, the signs and wonders were for. So that they knew that he had that authority. So if, if he was preaching the scripture, so that they, they knew that was to prove the word. It wasn't just some dream. And I'm really sorry but I'm not going to pat your back on the way to hell just because you don't want me to say that, oh, you had some dream and a God spoke to me and I, the Holy Spirit empowered me. That's not in the scripture. That's not how it happened in the New Testament. That's not how it happened with the Jews. It wasn't just some signs that they saw and it was, oh, I guess I believe the gospel now. It was the signs that they saw because it proved the scripture and the scripture that they knew spoke of it. And it was fulfilling of Scripture. So why did God set it up this way? Let's turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, and I'll start in verse 8. And Paul writes here, he says, The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the nations shall be blessed in you. So then, those who are of the faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. For as many as are of the works, uh, or, so as many as are of the works of, of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by every, uh, all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that as Christ Jesus, that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak in terms of human relations, even though it is only a man's covenant. 
Yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. What I'm saying is this, the law which came 430 years later does not invalidate the covenant previously ratified by God, so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on the law, it is no longer based on the promise, but God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. Why the law then? It was added because of transgression, having been ordained through the angels by the agency of a mediator, until the seed should come to whom the promise had been made. Stop there for a second. So, Paul touches on a few things there. Cursed is everyone who is under the law. Uh, the, the, as many, um, no one is justified by the law that was evident through the law that no one kept the law and was perfect outside of Jesus. Okay? So, Jesus, born under the law, as we'll see here in a second, um, as we see here too, born... Uh, became a curse for us that we would receive the Holy Spirit. That was the promise to Abraham, the Holy Spirit. And he goes into detail on what the promise was, who the promise was for. It wasn't to Abraham and to the physical descendants of Israel. It was to Abraham and Jesus, a seed. And because, as we'll see in a second here, we are in Christ. We are Abraham's offspring heirs according to the promise. Let's pick it up in verse 20. It says, Now a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. If for if the law had been given, for if a law had been given, which was able to impart life, then righteousness would have been indeed have been based on the law. But the scripture has shut all men un, up under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we, kept in, we were kept under custody, under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become a tutor to lead us to Christ, that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. So for all of you who are uh, sons of God, or, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are immersed into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. See, the law was a tutor. All men were shut up, uh, the scripture shut up all men up under sin, that the promise would come by faith in Christ. The law was a tutor to lead us to Christ. The law wasn't just something that, well, I guess God added it, and now I guess we got to just kind of just let it go. Maybe we should just tear it out of the back of the Bible because there's really no purpose to it. No, the law was to lead us to Christ. Verse, chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ from the slave, although he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardianship, guardians and managers until the date set by his father. So also we, while we were children, we were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, in order that he might redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons of God, uh, because you are sons, God has sent forth his spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Okay, so God had a plan. He, the law was part of the plan. It wasn't the only plan. It wasn't the main plan. It was something that he used to lead people to Christ. And it was... It, they were under bondage, under the law, until the time was right for the seed to come. Until Jesus came, when the time was right, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive the promise of Abraham, which is the spirit of truth or the Holy Spirit. So, if God, if the law was to lead us to Christ, what about the law is leading us to Christ? What did God do? Let's turn back to, to Numbers chapter 28. 
I'm gonna try and roll kind of fast here. I think he, I, I, I forgot to read in that text, I think he said an uh, hour 45 minutes or something, but I'm not sure if that was, <laughs> that was correct or not. Numbers 28, and we'll kind of skim through this and, and, and go back and read this because there's a lot of stuff here that I'm not going to be able to cover, and, uh, uh, but go back and read it and, and, and kind of get in your mind the, the order and the things that were necessary for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of, uh, or the, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Booths, and so on. But in verse 28, uh, verse 16, now let's notice something here. Notice which feasts are given dates. Okay, so in verse 16 of Numbers 28, it says, Then on the 14th day of the first month shall be the Lord's Passover, and on the 15th day of the month shall be the Feast of Unleavened Bread, sh shall be eaten for seven days. Okay, so on the 14th day is when they, they killed the Passover lamb. On the day after was when the, they had the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the first of the seven days that they had to have every, nothing, but they couldn't have any leaven in their houses. They were, they were cut off. Move down a few verses to verse 26. It says, uh, and, and you can read more about the Feast of uh, Unleavened Bread if you go read the verses before this, but verse 26, now it talks about the Feast of the First Fruits. Also, on the day of the First Fruits, when you present a new grain offering to the Lord in your, in your Feast of Weeks, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no laborious work. Okay. We come to the Feast of, of Pentecost, or uh, the harvest of first fruits of the wheat, no date given. Okay, now let's read down a little further. Uh, the start of the seventh month, there are certain things that God wanted him to do in verse 1 of, of Numbers 29. Uh, if we read to verse 7, it says, On the tenth day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation, you shall humble yourselves, and you shall not do any work. And it goes on, this is the Day of Atonement. Okay, the, the, the tenth day of the seventh month. And you read a little further down in verse, um, verse 12. And it says, Then on the fifteenth day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation, you shall do no laborious work, and you shall observe a feast of the Lord for seven days. And if we cross-reference that to Leviticus 23, 34, that's talking about the Feast of Booths. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or Passover, the Feast of Booths, the Day of Atonement, were all given dates, this and this day of this and this month. The Feast of Pentecost was not given a day, this and this day, a, a day of the month. It was, however, given the day of the week. Okay, let's turn over to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 16. Deuteronomy 16, and if you want to go read uh, some stuff about the unleavened bread and so on, uh, prior to this in uh, the early parts of verse 16, go, go ahead, and then there's uh, stuff about uh, the Feast of Booths a little later there, it mentions that as well. But in verse 9, in, in Deuteronomy 16, it says, you shall count, for, count seven weeks for yourself. And you shall begin to count the seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the standing grain. Then you shall celebrate the feast of weeks to the Lord your God. And with a tribute of a freewill offering of your hand, you shall give just as the Lord your God has blessed you. Okay, so I know this can be a little confusing, so ask a little bit of patience here as we kind of work through this. They were supposed to count seven weeks, which is how many days? How many people like math here in the, in the tent tonight? Okay, that's not looking very good right now. Okay, so, uh, so I was 49. Okay, so, so they were supposed to count from the time that they began to put the sickle to the standing grain. So the counting had something to do with the first harvest. Okay, now if you look up the, the harvest, the wheat harvest was, was not the first harvest. The barley harvest was, was this harvest that he's talking about. It has something to do with them putting a sickle to the ground and harvesting the barley, not the wheat. And the Feast of, of uh, Weeks is the Feast of the first fruits of the wheat harvest, not the barley harvest. Turn over to Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23.
And we'll read a little bit about the, the Passover here. Leviticus 23, starting in verse 4. And it says, These are the appointed times of, Lord, of the Lord, holy convocations which you shall proclaim at the times of the appointed for them. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at twilight, is the Lord's Passover. Then on the 15th day of the same month, there is a feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. And on the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. And for seven days you shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. On the seventh day you shall have a, is a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you enter the land which I am going to give you and reap the harvest, then you shall bring in a sheaf of the first fruits to your, of your harvest to the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord for you to be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Okay, so we have a little bit more information here. Okay, so first off, the Hebrew word for first fruits there is different. If you go down to verse 17, it talks about first fruits as well. It's a different Hebrew word. Verse 17 is talking about the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. Okay? And that, and that is different than what he's talking about here in verse 10. But it's also a first fruits. Remember, Deuteronomy said you, you, you count, it has a, to do with being associated with the barley harvest. Okay? The first fruit of the barley harvest, not the wheat harvest. That's when the day was counted. But notice what he says in verse uh, 11. He says, the, the priest is to wave the sheaf before the Lord for you to be accepted on the day after the Sabbath. The priest shall wave it. Now, so in, in the feast of, of uh, Passover, you had the first day of unleavened bread was a Sabbath, a high Sabbath. And the seventh day of unleavened bread was the highest Sabbath. That was the same for the Feast of Weeks and for the Feast of Booths. It was, it was the, the day one and day seven where it were high Sabbaths, whether they fell on Saturday or whether they fell on Wednesday or whatever they fell on Thursday or whatever day, first, whatever it was. It was a high Sabbath. Okay? It didn't have to be Saturday. So there is some debate among uh, the religious world when this counting started, whether it was the day after the high Sabbath or the day after the actual Saturday Sabbath during the week of unleavened bread. Okay, so let's just for a second here. The only feast that was not given a date was the Feast of Weeks. Okay, if it was to be the day after the high Sabbath, it would have been on the 16th day of the first month, okay? Because the, the Pentecost, or Passover was on the 14th, they killed the Passover lamb, and on the 15th day was a high Sabbath. And so if it, was, if it was after the high Sabbath, then it was pretty easy to go and say, well, he should have just said the sixth day of the third month. That's when the Feast of Pentecost starts. But he didn't say that. So it, makes, it doesn't make, uh, make as much sense for it to be after the high Sabbath because that's basically a fixed date. That's, that's a fixed the same day of the month every year. Okay? The Sabbath that he's talking about, okay, so we also have, we have holidays. This is not new to us. Okay? So my birthday is July 7th. It's a different day of the week every year on the same day of, of the month. Okay? But there is... Uh, Certain holidays that are on the same day of the week, but on a different day of the month, such as Mother's Day, such as Father's Day, such as Thanksgiving. Okay, the same day of the week, uh, but it is the uh, same day of the week, so it's a different day of the month. Okay, as for a birthday or Christmas or whatever else, uh, harvest party, not Halloween, um, but uh, of that day, Th those are all even, you know, I'm not even going to call that a holiday anyway. That's not a holiday. But anyway, the point is, is that those days are the same days of the month, but different days of the week. That's why the high Sabbath did, wasn't always on a Saturday. The 15th day of the first month could have been a Tuesday, could have been a Thursday, which was the day, uh, or could have been a Friday, which was the day Je the year Jesus was crucified. But Pentecost wasn't a fixed day of the month. There was a way to count it, just like uh, what's Mother's Day? How do, you, how do we calculate Mother's Day? What's, what's the, it's the what Sunday of May? 
second, second Sunday, was Father's Day. You don't know. Yeah, Father's Day. Okay. Anyway, so there's certain times. So, so we're given uh, ways to calculate that. That's how Pentecost was. It wasn't the same day of the, of the, of the month. It was the same. You began the counting. You began the counting from the same day of the week. The Sabbath that he's talking about here is the Saturday Sabbath, which would have fallen on, and that would have been different. So the counting, the, the, the distance between Pentecost and Passover would have varied a little bit. Not very much, but would have varied. Okay, so if Passover would have been on, on uh, Monday, uh, then it would have been a little longer between Passover and Pentecost. Okay, because the first Sabbath, first Saturday Sabbath during the week of unleavened bread, the day after that, which would have been the first day of the week, is when they did the wave offering, and that's when they calculated the 49 days plus the 50 days to get the day of, pa of Pentecost. So why am I telling you all this? Uh, if you want to, I'm not going to have time tonight, go look in Joshua 5, and you'll see that, that what uh, he says here in Leviticus chapter 23, you'll see that they had the Passover and they reaped the first fruits the next day. Okay? And so that the, the next day, if, if, this, if this Passover or the, the first day of unleavened bread was on a Saturday, they could reap the fruits and have the wave offering on the first day of the week and so on. So now let's uh, go back to Acts chapter 2 real fast. And as we're turning there, you want more information on, on uh, ex, uh, the Passover, details in the Passover, you'll go find them in, in Exodus 12, and you'll see that, that the Passover was something that uh, they killed the lamb right about sunset, right before uh, the next day. And so how the Jews counted days, and this is important when, you, when you're trying to, to look at when, when they would start counting, when Jesus resurrected and so on, the end of the day, if we were Jews, would be in, you know, it's not quite dark yet, but it would be when dark, when it was dark. So basically, if we were Jews, we would say, okay, when it gets dark, then it's Saturday, okay? Even though we call it Friday night, they, they, if you go back to Genesis 1, they, when God created the heavens and the earth, there was evening and morning the first day and so on. The evening was at the first part of the day, of the 24-hour period, okay? So when the Jews were... Uh, Calculating this stuff, they would, they would have the Passover, they would kill the lamb on the 14th day, right at sunset, and that feast would carry on into the 15th day. They'd have unleavened bread, because uh, they would, you know, if it was 6 o'clock, that's kind of what it usually you figure, 6 o'clock, then it was the next day, okay? That feast would, would carry on, be the first day, and so that would be a holy convocation. They wouldn't be able to work and so on like that. So remember that for a little later. But notice one thing, and I kind of brought it up before in Acts chapter 2. Verse 5, it says, Now there were devout Jews, or there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. Now it's, it's interesting to note, uh, it's not the same word that is given to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. But both of those words for devout have the same root word. And that root word is found in, in Matthew 25 when Jesus says, Well done, good and faithful servant. Okay, That's where that comes from. And so devout isn't that they were necessarily, I mean, they were devout, devoted to the law, but they were really honestly searching the scriptures. Okay, They were, they were ready for something. Even though they didn't necessarily believe Jesus at the time, they, they had the, the ground ready to be able to receive the message. Now, I'm not going to get into this a lot. Jesus was crucified on Thursday. It's not Good Friday. It's Good Thursday. Okay. So when you calculate that, then the first Sabbath after the first day after the the normal Sabbath, seventh, Saturday Sabbath during the uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread that year was the first day of the week, the day that Jesus resurrected from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15 says that he was uh, a first fruits from the dead. 
So Jesus was resurrected on the day when they would have waved the sheaf offering uh, of the first fruits of the barley harvest. So the Jews, these devout Jews, and without trounch and all over Matt Harford's message, there, there was a little bit, it was a little bit uh, different. Something happened that Passover that hadn't always happened. So they were probably paying attention. Something happened at Pentecost that didn't just happen every year. So when they're sitting here thinking this, and you look in Acts chapter 2, verse 40, and I hope someone doesn't have that verse, but, but uh, they, Peter... From uh, kept encouraging them or exhorting them. I should go read just to make sure. With many other words, he solemnly testified and kept exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this reverse generation. He wasn't just instructing, now you plug the nose here, you dip them backwards, make sure they're fully under. He wasn't, that's not many words. Yeah, I'm sure he probably was instructing a little bit on immersion, but that's not the many other words that he was instructing. The many other words that he would have been instructing would have been the Old Testament scriptures, which they would have been ready to hear. They were devout men. They were ready to, to they knew the scriptures. I mean, at least for the most part. But they could without the help of the Holy Spirit. And so when Peter is, as, you know, I won't get into it, but there's obviously some Old Testament scriptures that are in the book of Acts, chapter 2 here, and later, they were ready, they, they, they were ready to hear the message. Now, so they're sitting here counting, 53 days ago, something really crazy happened. This, you know, this guy, you know, was crucified. It didn't really necessarily, wasn't uh, normal, so to speak. And then, you know, I'm pretty sure, because we got in that Matthew chapter 28, the Jews were spreading that this Jesus had, you know, the apostles had come out of the grave. And so there, with this information, these Jews are sitting here, what's this all about? Man, I think... I remember something about the Spirit being poured out from the Old Testament Scriptures. And so they're starting to do the counting. And they're starting to say, okay, so 50 days ago, something happened. You know, hey, maybe, maybe that guy did actually resurrect from the dead. Turn back to Isaiah chapter 25. Now, as we go, go there, uh, you can go look up on your own. In John chapter 4, when Jesus is, uh, after he has talked to the woman at the well, uh, a Samaritan woman, she goes back into town and he tells his apostles, you say yet yeah, it's four months till harvest, but look, the field is ready for the harvest. And Jesus is calling the first fruits the souls of the people who are going to be preached to. That's, he said, that's ready. In Isaiah chapter 25, starting in verse 8, it says, And he will swallow up death for all time, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from their, from their faces, and he will move the reproach for, of his people from the, all the earth, and the, for the Lord has spoken. And it was said that the, the, on that day, behold, our God... Uh, for whom we have waited, that he might save us, that the, is the Lord whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. See, the Jews, the devout Jews, would have studied the scriptures and they would have been like, man, we've been waiting for this Messiah to save us, to swallow up death. Turn to Isaiah 44. Isaiah 44, verse 3. And it says, For I will pour out water on a thirsty land, and the streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and the, my blessings on your descendants, and they will spring up among like grass, like poplars by the stream of water, this one, this one will say, I am the Lord's, and that will call on the name of Jacob. And another one will write on his hand, belonging to the Lord, and he will name Israel, be, he, and, with, and will name Israel's name with honor. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. There is no God besides me, and who is like me? Let him proclaim and declare it. 
Yes, let him recount it to me in order. From the time that I established the ancient nation, let, him, let them declare to them the things that are coming and the events that are going to take place. Didn't, do not tremble and do not be afraid. Have I, have I not long since announced it to you and declared it to you? And you are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me or is there any rock? I know of none. See, there was prophecy about the pouring out of the Spirit upon his descendants. The Jews didn't just believe the apostles because the Spirit was the tongues of fire. He, they believed the apostles because the tongues of fire proved the Old Testament scriptures of which they were students of because they were devout Jews. So they were ready to receive the message. And there's a ton more you can go into. You can talk about the Feast of Passover. You can talk about the Feast of Booths. You talk about the Day of Atonement. You talk about all kinds of stuff. And it's pointing towards the church. I remember uh, uh, Mr. Doty a few years ago. I can't remember if it was last year. But he was making the point. He was talking about when Jesus was on uh, the cross. And he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he talked about the way of looking at that. He said, Jesus didn't quote Psalm 22. Psalm 22 quoted Jesus. And that's what, when we're looking at the law, when God, when God talks about this, the law as a tutor, there's things in the law that God specifically set up pointing forward to the church. When we view the things of the Old Testament, when we view the things in the Scripture, we're not to view it as, well, we're just kind of, we're like the Feast of Pentecost. No, the Feast of Pentecost is like us. That's the right view to have it. The Jews, when they were devout men, they knew their history. And they were sitting there, they had been waiting for this Messiah. You know, they, they, they obviously, the devout Jews, they probably looked at the book of Daniel when the kingdom of God was going to be set up during the days of the Roman kings, of who a lot of premillennialists twist today false teaching to get to the premillennialist kingdom that's still in the future, which it's not. The, the Jews understood it. Abraham understood it better than most people do today without the help of the Holy Spirit. They were looking for, they, they had Jeremiah talk about the new covenant that he was going to have. They, they were looking for it. The same is true for us. It's not, it's not just some, you know, on a whim salvation that we have today. It's not just some dream that we're going to have. Oh, man, I, I bet, you know, God spoke to me in that dream. I died and went to heaven for seven minutes, or I died and went to hell for 30 minutes, whatever it is. I think the word is true, which Abraham told the rich man, if they don't believe Moses, the law, and the prophets, they're not going to believe that so you go back and tell them. All that is is a bunch of phony, fake Christianity. That is not how the foundation was set. That's not what the Jews had in the first century. That's not what the true saints have now. Thank you.